Good afternoon. I think we're getting started for the fourth panel. I know it's been a long day. <laughs> um, and we're a little bit behind time, but we'll, we'll catch up and we'll try to be um, uh, ebullient. Um, good afternoon. My name is Deborah Mutnick. Um, it's kind of hard to, to go last because there's so much more to say than I had thought before, before coming here today. Um, I, I want to kind of just throw out a couple of words that um, I'm thinking of as, as we go forward with this last uh, roundtable. Um, one is, is river, reverberation, that this river to, the, to reverberate, as Alessandro Portelli said, and that so much of what's already, already been said today will re continue to reverberate in this panel and beyond. Um, and um, I, I love, um, Dr. Portelli, your line about people's folklore traveling with the people. Um, and I, I, I thought that that theme reverberated today very much so. And um, in the last round table, the idea of the American project was mentioned. And I think we really have to think deeply <laughs> about what that project is, what it's been historically, what it is right now, um, what it might be. And to think about that in, in terms of the nationalism, which Jerry Hirsch talks so much about, of the Federal Writers Project, a different kind of nationalism than the kind that led to fascism, um, but nationalism nonetheless, and internationalism. Because I think that this idea of a people's folklore that travels with the people um, and the current moment in which we're seeing immigrants um, being turned away at borders, including our own borders, not being welcomed in to our countries when we know that there is no monoculturalism. There has never been any monoculturalism. The world has always been multicultural. We just haven't always recognized it. And there are still many parts of our country today that don't recognize that. So, um, uh, One of the things I was um, very uh, uh, happy to have done and grateful to have done is to co-directed the NEH Summer Institute on the Federal Writers Project in the summer of 2021. We met virtually during the pandemic and many of the people who participated in that symposium are here today in that institute are here today at the symposium. And so I think um, seeing the generativity, which was a word that came up over and over again uh, during the Summer Institute of how generative this subject matter is, um, is something that, that's another word that comes to mind to me today. Um, so we're very honored to follow Alessandro Portelli's amazing keynote and all the brilliant presentations. <clears throat> this round table explores the relationship between the FWP and contemporary educational projects. And that was one of the questions I kept thinking of during the presentations. How do we get this material out beyond the scholarship that we're doing? How do we do what you're doing with filmmaking and bringing a film about the narratives of formerly enslaved people to high school students? <clears throat> um, and also the public humanities, right? So not just what we do in schools, what we do in curriculum, but also um, uh, the public humanities. What, are, what is the public humanities? Um, it's the, in the title of the last two round tables, um, and it's a word that gets thrown a lot, around a lot in academia, um, but I don't know that we, we think much about what it is. Um, but you know, it can encompass art, performance, literature, histories of places, communities, social movements, and more. It uses methods of oral history, uh, museum exhibitions, podcasts, digital technologies to reach, create, and serve a broad, diverse public. And I think in many ways we can think of the FWP as America's first public humanities project. Its influence on contemporary work in these areas can be traced to its various programs that you've been learning about today, the guidebooks, the life histories, the collection of interviews of formerly enslaved people. But many of those threads were broken by Cold War politics, the eagerness of Americans to forget about the ordeal of the Great Depression, scattered FWP archives, episodic research on the project, often reflecting the periodic economic crises, 
most recently in 2020, um, during which calls for a new New Deal, WPA and or Federal Writers Project surfaced. Um, its imprint, not always acknowledged, can be seen in so many aspects of America's cultural history, including the creation of the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, the National Endowment for the Arts in the mid-1960s, the passage of the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, CETA, which didn't come up yet today, I don't think, but that was in the 1970s, and that too was putting unemployed workers back to work, including artists and writers in schools. I was one of them, I was a CETA worker, um, and other sites nationwide. The rise of popular storytelling projects, like StoryCorps, The Moth, and Foxfire, and the widespread use of oral history as a method to document both everyday life, often from the bottom up, and social crises like HIV AIDS, Hurricanes Katrina and Sandy, and COVID-19, as so brilliantly illustrated by Zawadi's C-19 project. So we aim in this round table to recover those historical threads and present current work in education in and out of the classroom and the public humanities at a time when the FWP mission, and this has come up repeatedly today, um, of inclusiveness, pluralism, telling a people's history is as urgently needed, if not more so, as it was during the Great Depression when nearly a third of the country was out of work and Jim Crow still ruled. Let me briefly introduce my co-panelists who will be presenting in the order I named them. And all of them were in the Institute, in the Summer Institute, so we keep greeting each other and say, it's so great to see you in person. <laughs> so you only see each other on Zoom. Um, Benji LaPiedra is a visiting fellow at the Library of Congress John W. Kluge Center for Scholars and is co-directing the Oral History Association's 2023 conference on oral history as and education, very timely. Anna Kaplan is a professorial lecturer of history and resident public historian at American University, trained in history, oral history, anthropology, and folklore. And Michelle Fazio is professor of English and director of the Reach Mellon program, which he's going to be talking about today, uh, at the University of North Carolina, Pembroke, and I'll be the last speaker, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions afterwards. So I'm gonna turn it over to Benji. Do you wanna go first? That's great. You can do whatever you want. No, someone go on and say, I don't wanna be the only one to stand. I'll stand. So you're gonna, oh, you're gonna stand, okay, all right. I wanted to stand, I just didn't wanna feel bad about it. Um, so uh, before I start talking, I just wanna invite everyone to like, take a nice deep breath as we enter this last of um, what feels like a really fast day. This day just flew by um, and it's, it's been a packed day. Um, I like to try to bring like contemplative modes of being and mindfulness um, into oral history work. I think that's what makes the work good and worthwhile. So um, I'm gonna do my best to start, you know, kind of slowly here before I ratchet up into the passionate, like why spend time with the WFP um, question. Um, I'm also probably gonna end up kind of vaunting our discussion into what we might call like a spiritual plane. It's very important to me that oral history is not just um, like a research method and there's nothing wrong with research. Um, but it's, it's not just a place where two bodies meet. It's not just a place where two minds meet. Um, oral history is a space where two souls meet um, if, it's, if it's happening in the right way. Um, and so, when I'm saying this, I'm thinking about how important it is to, and this is what my teachers have taught me, um, you wanna start from a place of gratitude. So I do wanna just begin by thanking Deb and, and Sarah um, for having organized the institute in the first place. I'm working with Guha to put this whole um, symposium together. Um, I'm super grateful to meet you know, so many people that I only knew on Zoom, but like we knew each other, you know, we saw each other every day for a month. Um, you know, it, was, it was intense, it was a shared learning experience. So um, just very grateful to, to everybody for making the time to to come to the symposium. Um, I'm gonna invoke, uh, of course, the idea of education. Um, B.A. Botkin, uh, the folklore editor of, of the Writers' Project, um, at one point referred to the Federal Writers' Project as the greatest social as well as educational experiment of our time. The greatest social as well as educational experiment of our time. 
Um, and so I just want to kind of leave that hanging over, you know, the rest of our discussion. What does it mean to think about the Writers Project as a great educational experiment, right? Not just an educational experience, but an educational experiment. Um, I'm also, of course, thinking about um, Dr. Portelli's keynote on the educational experience of fieldwork, the transformative experience of fieldwork, um, how the education that we get from the interviews we conduct is not just about content, um, but it's an education about ourselves, right? We're learning to, I love what he said, right? We're learning to see ourselves as reflected in the eyes of the people that we are talking to, right? Like we're literally reflected back to ourselves um, in those eyes. Um, so again, I want to kind of invoke that um, kind of in the, kind of set the tone, set the spirit for what we'll be talking about. Um, because we're talking about education, we have to talk about journeys. Um, I'm really interested in the journey whatever that means, the idea of the journey as a venue for education. Um, whenever I teach oral history, I always tell people like, you're, you're really capturing or documenting somebody's journey through life as focused by whatever questions it is that you're interested in having answered. Um, you know, oral historians or life historians are journey historians. Um, oral history is the art of learning from other people's journeys. And to the question earlier of like, why, why would Americans care so much about each other's stories, it's because like this is a country that's founded on the idea of a, of a journey whose conclusion is not yet clear, right? Again, it's, it's an experiment. It's very kind of um, still in its beginning. It's always iterating kind of phase. Um, so this idea of the journey is important because if we're thinking about oral history, it gets us into the realm of biography. Um, I think that the Federal Writers Project was one of the great works, great repositories of American biography. And I also think it was one of the great catalysts of American biography in the 20th century um, because not only was it recording life histories and biographies of citizens, of narrators, um, not only was it playing a big role in the biographies of those who would, you know, work, who would work on the project, uh, who essentially got an apprenticeship experience and then went on to great careers in, um, you know, in, in arts and letters. Um, but it's also a catalyst for the biographies of us, right, as the researchers, as the people who are rediscovering what's in the archive. Um, I overheard you at dinner last night, Michelle, saying, like, you're a federal writer too, right? Like, yeah, like we, yeah, I mean, we all kind of take on this, um, take on this mantle and kind of take on um, uh, the story of, of what it means to become uh, somebody who's involved with the, with the Federal Writers Project. Um, we all have a Federal Writers Project journey, everybody in this room you're in this room for some reason, something brought you here, uh, an interest in the Writers Project. And so it's cool that the symposium is an experience that we're all sharing, um, each in our individual journeys, right? That the shared experience will play a role uh, that has different meanings depending on, you know, whose journey it is. Um, and so I'm gonna very briefly, again, just to kind of try to set the tone within probably the less than four minutes I have left, um, just very briefly sketch out my Writers Project journey and some of what it's taught me um, so I, my, writer, my Federal Writers Project journey starts uh, with Ralph Ellison. I was prepared to recognize what oral history is, like the real power uh, and the spirit of oral history, um, because I had read Invisible Man uh, in the summer between my sophomore and junior years of college. Um, I reread it, I got obsessed with it. Again, this is like a whole memoir I need to write. It's a whole long talk I could give, but basically reading Ralph Ellison like totally transformed me and gave me a sense of myself as um, like really an American. I'm, I'm the first in my family to be born in the US. Um, I'm a first generation American. So Ellison has done a lot for me um, to help myself feel at home in, in this country and what he calls the beautiful absurdity of America. Um, make a long story short, I went into the master's program in oral history at Columbia University. Um, I was in the course of a, a short year, you know, a year that really flew by. Uh, trying to figure out a thesis topic that would let me keep talking about Ralph Ellison. Um, how can I tie Ralph Ellison to oral history? Um, and somewhere along the way, I discovered for myself, of course, you know, this had already been written about, but discovered for myself that Ellison had worked on the Writers Project and that he had been conducting interviews. Um, and so this led me to um, come to the library here, actually, um, look in the folders marked FWP and the Ellison papers in the manuscript division, um, and I came across a, uh, a news clipping, an announcement for a book that uh, was about to be published at the time, this is in 1979, called First Person America. Uh, and First Person America was edited by a researcher named Ann Banks, who did the Herculean and heroic task of 
coming to the library over the course of the 1970s and cataloging uh, a lot of these narratives that have been left to sit in a file cabinet, many file cabinets for 30 something years. Um, and so long story short, Ellison was quoted on the back of First Person America and he had kept a news clipping in his, in his folders of this uh, book announcement. And so I, being a foolish young scholar, Googled Ann Banks and found an email address and emailed her and she said, wow, that's so interesting that somebody actually you know, is, is doing this work. So you know, come and visit me in New York. Um, and she shared with me when I went to visit her, uh, her original typescript of an interview she conducted on the phone with Ellison in 1977 for her book. Um, and it was in that interview that I saw Ellison, and he would repeat this many times, he said it at NYPL about 10 years later, but this idea that the Writer's Project experience was an education for him, that it was teaching him about his own people. And the way he phrases it is great. He says, well, you know, I was on the New York City Writer's Project and had a variety of assignments um, that all had to do with researching New York City history. And once you're into New York history, you're into American history, and then you're into Negro history. Like, it's all tied together. Um, there shouldn't be this kind of separation between historical threads um, and that the oral history work was getting him to appreciate that. Uh, and I just found that really inspiring. And the more I read about Ellison's time on the project, the more I came to appreciate just how much his biographer Lawrence P. Jackson nailed it when he referred to Ellison's time on the Writers Project as an improvised graduate school experience. Um, you know, I went into my master's program right after finishing undergrad. I you know, always loved school and always knew I wanted to do something creative but wasn't exactly sure what. And so this idea of like taking on an oral history project as a way to educate yourself, as a way to keep your own education going, to improvise your own graduate school experience um, was really inspiring. Um, and I'm, I don't think I'm alone in that. Um, and so, again, I'm probably over time here, but um, there's a whole Ellison discussion we could have, which I won't have right now. We can do that in the Q&A if, if you guys feel like it. Um, just one more story, one more stop on my Federal Writers Project journey. Uh, right after finishing my master's, I went to Little Rock, Arkansas to start doing um, interviews towards chapter one of a biography. I um, am still hoping to write uh, some eight years later about a man named Herbert Denton Jr. who was a journalist uh, here in DC at the Washington Post. Among other things, he was the first black city editor of the Washington Post uh, in the late 1970s. Um, I went to Little Rock because that's where he, he, was, he was raised, that's where he was from. Um, and quickly upon my arrival, I discovered that like the best published source, the best book on what it was like to be growing up black in Little Rock in the 1940s was a book called um, Survey of the Negroes of Little Rock and North Little Rock, uh, which had been published by the Urban League branch of Little Rock in 1941, but had been entirely conducted as a federal writer's project um, study of black life in Arkansas. And the man who wrote that text is also the person who conducted almost all the interviews for it. His name was Samuel S. Taylor. Um, and it occurred to me that I just wanted to invoke Mr. Taylor's name here um, because he, I think, stands for a whole class of federal writers who went on to have really interesting and productive careers in the world of what we could broadly call kind of literacy, right? Like he went on, and I could give you his biographical sketch later, but um, he did not go on to become a Ralph Ellison but he did tremendous service to his community and to you know, the reverberations to us as researchers um, because the Writers Project gave him the opportunity to do so. And one thing I learned later about Taylor, uh, and this is thanks to a scholar named Linda McDowell who published a short biography of him in the Pulaski County Historical Review um, of Arkansas. Um, Taylor uh, was a minister. Um, he was he he was a math teacher um, at the at the black high school in Little Rock before he was a federal writer. Um, before moving to Little Rock, even he had been the he had been the first supervisor of Negro public schools in uh, New Orleans. Um, very impressive man, very highly regarded in the community. Um, and one reason that he likely took on the Writers Project experience, he ended up interviewing 125 people in Little Rock, um, was because he had wanted to do a, a PhD. Uh, at an unnamed Eastern University that was probably Columbia, um, according to the scholar. Um, and he wanted to do a PhD on the social and economic conditions of Negro life in America at that time in the 30s. And he was rejected for reasons that were not really explained, but this scholar basically explains like it was racism. And so the Writers Project gave him a chance to carry out this personal, you know, you could call it a passion project, um, and I, again, I just find that really inspiring. It raises questions about like 
because the other thing about Taylor is that he never talked about his writer's project experience. Like people who knew him later in life didn't realize he had done this work. And I think that might have to do with the, the, the state direction of, of the Arkansas project, which was mentioned earlier. Um, but anyways, just kind of wanted to, to invoke these ideas as we're talking about education. Like what does it mean um, or what does it look like to do oral history work that involves really deep conversation with people and self-reflection um, to make the most of that um, in your personal educational life cultivating journey. Um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for sticking with us this whole day for this last panel. Um, also, thank you again, echoing Benji's thank you to uh, everyone who helped make the NEH Institute happen, and then also all of our organizers for today's symposium. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about some of the historical projects of public humanities and education that inform some of my work and the way that I approach the Federal Writers Project and some of the projects that I engage students and the general public with as public history. Um, so as Deborah mentioned, I come to this work with a training in anthropology and folklore and oral history, um, but also as a quote unquote traditional historian. Um, and for all of this, I am going to start with some context and some background on some historical projects. Um, I am primarily a scholar of African American history, and um, so a lot of the projects I'm going to be referencing are dedicated to that history. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge a lot of the other practices and traditions that people bring to informing their work with oral history and folklore documentation um, that are from a range of cultures and backgrounds, um, and particularly thinking about Noreen Rivera's uh, discussion earlier in one of the previous panels about some of the Mexican or Mexican-American traditions of storytelling that were captured in the WPA. Um, so in particular, I want to highlight some of the African-American oral history and listening traditions that were in practice before the Federal Writers Project began. And this is not to take anything away from the Federal Writers Project, but really to think about the Federal Writers Project as part of this larger ecosystem and being um, people with, involved in the Federal Writers Project navigating some of their own cultural backgrounds and traditions as well as what the Federal Writers Project was telling them, what the administrators were telling them that they wanted and wanted to to archive and to publish from the project. So a couple of these are um, John B. Cade Sr., who was working at Southern University in Mississippi in the uh, 1920s, and he assigned students to go out and do oral histories with formerly enslaved people who lived around the university. Um, several years after that, so in the late 1920s, early 1930s, Ophelia Settle Egypt, whose picture you can see on the slide, um, was doing sociological surveys for Charles Johnson at Fisk University. And as she was going out and talking to people collecting this data, she experienced how a lot of the people were turning these sessions into storytelling sessions, that they didn't just want to give her the data that she could collect and analyze as part of her sociology work, but they wanted to use her as a way to put their stories in an archive to make their stories part of the historical record, especially because she was attached to Fisk University. And that resonates a lot with what Dr. Fratelli said earlier about narrators looking at interviewers sometimes as the skills or access that you can provide rather than the individual you are necessarily. Um, she is also important because one of uh, Charles Johnson's students at the time, Lawrence D. Reddick, saw her and her work. Um, he was studying with Johnson, but he also was part of um, incorporating some of the field work that she was doing, the oral histories that she was collecting into their archives and into their research. And he later advocated for the Federal Writers Project to start and implement 
an ex-slave narrative project. His project that he proposed was to use African-American students to do the interviews with formerly enslaved people. His project only was able to just barely get initiated, it didn't go very far, uh, but it preceded by a couple years the actual widespread ex-slave narrative project that the Federal Writers Project actually implemented. Um, so this is a way that you can see some of the trickling of some of these traditions and these approaches that people from outside the Federal Writers Project brought to these projects and the ways in which they wanted to engage and respond to the communities that they were working with. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, the project that Rasko Lewis was the director of um, at Hampton Institute that Guha mentioned earlier as well. And this was a project that came out of the Federal Writers Project. But it's important because Rasko Lewis continued this project long after the FWP concluded. And so it's a way of continuing the work of the Federal Writers Project, even though the actual um, institution and support was not there in the same way. So these are some projects that I emphasize to my students as a way for them to think about how the communities that they're working with, the publics that they're engaging with, bring their own traditions and practices to this work and to the projects that we work on collaboratively. Um, Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a few projects that I've worked with or that I've heard about recently. And these all highlight a further shift uh, building on the work of the FWP that goes from instruction to providing support and resources. So instead of having academics going out and telling communities this is the history or collecting histories and putting them in an archive that's hard for the general public to access, it's about a lot of providing um, the means for communities to document their own stories and to share them and interpret them themselves. So the first one is the DC Oral History Collaborative, which I helped um, establish and grow, and Benji also um, helped in the early years as well. Um, and this is a, um, a collaboration between the DC Public Library, Humanities DC, and at one point the Historical Society of DC. And it's a government funded program that provides the skills and access to technology and also some funding through grants for people in the city to do their own oral history projects. It's a way for the city, people within the city, to identify whose stories are important, who is included as a resident of DC, as someone being from DC, and to put them in an archive. And this is also a way to combat or resist some of the gentrification that's been happening in the city over the past several decades. It's a way for people to state claim and to make their histories known. The project also emphasizes um, and facilitates people going into archives and using oral histories in public ways. And that can be through artwork, it can be through digital mapping, um, it can be through creating a podcast, a range of things. So part of this idea to not only collect the stories from a very grassroots um, effort, but also to share out the stories in ways that the public thinks is most accessible to, uh, to their peers and to other public members. Another project that I heard about recently is the Douglas Memorial Cemetery and African American Burial Grounds Documentation Project. And this is a project being done by descendants of people buried in an African American um, cemetery in um, Alexandria, Virginia, so just across the river from here. Um, they are also working with the Alexandria Oral History Program and they are collecting oral histories with ancestors and also looking at archival documents in order to see where people were buried and to try and reclaim some of the land and push back against development that is encroaching on and perhaps has even covered up some of these burials. Um, and so thinking about the ways in which projects like oral history projects that were inspired by the Federal Writers Project can also be a way to reclaim some of these spaces and these histories that a lot of uh, gentrification or development has tried to push out of the way and to redefine 
who we are as a community, who, where our neighborhoods are, and what those histories are. And the last one that I want to highlight is the humanities truck uh, with American University, um, and that's directed by Dan Kerr. And this is a converted food truck that has been turned into a museum space. So it's a truck that can be driven into neighborhoods, um, parked and have exhibits on display, but also can be a space where people can come in and record oral histories, um, share their stories, and uh, participate in collecting on site in their neighborhoods, both the documentation of their neighborhoods, but also the sharing back and interpretation of their histories and what their neighborhoods mean to them. Um, also, lastly, just to wrap up, since a former colleague of mine, Jim Deutsch, is here from the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, I also want to highlight the work of the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, um, which is coming up soon at the end of June and the beginning of July. Um, of how that festival brings people who, um, who have these folk knowledges and bring their crafts to the National Mall and engage with visitors firsthand and have these discussions about their crafts and their life stories um, and share that with people who are engaging with them. So also seeing that as a form of public humanities and public engagement and not just putting things in an archive, even though that's invaluable, but also having people on site engaging with publics who they wouldn't come into contact with on a normal basis. So thank you. So I'd like to thank everyone um, who put this on today, including the people who have fed us and they're setting up the for the reception. I'm really grateful for that. Um, well, grateful for their work. <laughs> Um, so I'd like to talk today about two, approaching, uh, two approaches to teaching, and now that I'm thinking about it, this time of the day I should have assigned you some work, but <laughs> you, you're not, you don't have to do anything. So after completing the NEH Summer Institute, I began incorporating the archives in my contemporary literature courses as well as the graduate seminars I teach on working class literature. Archival research, as many of you probably know, requires students to be actively involved in, a, in the learning process. They explored and discovered connections in the life histories and later applied what they learned to the literary text we had read in class. So the first assignment is here. I asked my students to explore the state guides through the lens of labor and class. So this link will bring you to Google Books, Happy Trust, and the Internet Archive. And I wanted them to skim the state that they chose to focus on. So they had to read the headings um, and just to familiarize themselves with the layout of the guide. And this prepares them to focus on the section of industry and labor. Um, what I asked students to do is to um, provide an overview in a shared Google Doc, but the states, the key terms in the states vary. So I gave them this list, look for labor, industry, work, working, commerce, economics, and manufacturing. And so they had to learn how to access these primary sources on their own, which was a challenge in a fully online class. I gave them directions and I said, go learn this. Um, the sites are not always easy to navigate. Some links don't work, uh, the guides are incomplete. And I encourage students to trust themselves. This is part of the learning experience. I think even as researchers, you can't just, you can't always find what you're looking for, but um, we learn how to do that. So they wrote annotations of these sections, which broadened an understanding of the different kinds of work being done around the country. They also learned about the regional impact of manufacturing and industry that it had on people, as well as the struggle of workers to unionize. And working in North Carolina, this is, it's a right to work state, so this is really new information for them, even though it's from the 1930s. And more importantly, the students worked independently and collaboratively on constructing an overview of labor. And this is a wonderful exercise, I think, to teach undergraduate students that they could produce a document like this. So the second assignment, I asked students to explore the life histories focusing on the categorization of ethnic groups. So we looked at Italian Americans, Mexican Americans, Greek, German, Cuban Americans, American Indians, and many, many others. Again, I had a sign-up sheet and I had students choose the category they were interested in. 
And the goal was to identify the voices of working class Americans to see how labor impacted home life and their cultural identity and, and to include a study of race, gender, and region. So students followed this template and annotated five to six interviews on their own. And this template was created by my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Maureen Curtin. Uh, we're currently co-editing co a book together. It's called Working Through the Federal Writers Project, Labor, Place, Archive, and Representation, which focuses on how the FWP fits in the larger framework of labor studies from trade unions and working conditions to the political economy and the everyday um, reality of working lives. It also looks how F at how FWP writers understood their work recording these inter uh, interviews as a form of labor. So I wanna show you here one example of, of a student's annotation. And I, I realize uh, with the screens, it's a little difficult to read, but this is the story of uh, the interview of Mary Ann Meehan. Uh, it's actually on display over there in the corner. She was an Irish immigrant who was incredibly proud of the, wor of the food that she cooked. The interview details her work as a, as a cook, as she tried to make healthy meals, and related stories even of her own mother's recipes. Uh, and here's one. Uh, she talked about uh, putting cherries and sugar and alcohol to create what she called a cherry bounce. She said, that always livened up a party. <laughs> so my favorite part in reading these annotations was to see the quotes that stood out to my students. So here for, for Meehan, uh, my student, uh, she chose this, this quote, if you want to know how good food can taste, go without a few meals. So the life histories, as my students are showing you, worked against romanticized notions of assimilation and class mobility in American society. They capture a wide range of, wor range of workers' experiences, including those who are underpaid, overworked, and out of work. Uh, there's one, uh, one story of an alcoholic Italian immigrant stonecutter in Vermont that comes to mind. He wrote, or he's, he relayed to the interviewer, it's fine, delicate work. You got to have a steady hand and a sharp eye to cut letters. It's nervous work. It strains a man. After eight hours of that, you need a drink, all right? You need a dozen drinks. So we hear stories of perseverance of women whose husbands died on the job and became bootleggers, breaking from traditional roles in order to support their children. I would encourage folks to look at women's lives in, in these life histories, they're fascinating. So this past spring, I taught two online contemporary literature sections totaling 50 students, and together they yielded over 200 pages of annotations. It was a lot to read. Um, but it's essentially creating a database that I'm hoping to incorporate in a digital story map. Uh, students are, are demonstrating numerous skills in this assignment. They summarized, they synthesized, and analyzed life histories. I also had them record video excerpts of life histories uh, and respond to one another. So they were able to put that in, in the, the, the learning module and they were comparing interviews, like, oh, my, my person talked about ethnic conflict, or my person talked about her husband um, getting sick from work. So that kind of work is what we expect students to do, and the life histories really um, make it an easy thing to, to accomplish. Um, it was also important for students to see, um, to hear the orality of the interview. So I did preface this assignment to you know, be respectful of the dialect and of the language and don't make a caricature of it, but try your best just to capture the essence of that segment that you wanted to share with the class. So in December, um, the second part I'm going to talk about, in December 2019, my home institution, UNCP, received a multi-year grant from the Andrew Mellon Foundation to promote the study of humanities with underrepresented students who wanted to pursue graduate school. So UNCP is the most diverse campus um, in the South, in the Southeast. We have a large population of American Indian, Hispanic American, African American, and first generation students. Uh, as director of REACH, uh, and you can see the acronym there, um, I lead students to conduct research in the humanities and engage the community. So fellows meet with their mentors to outline a research project of their own throughout the year. And the summer exploration component that you see here is currently underway. Last week, we hosted a number of visiting scholars, several of whom are here today, to lead discussion on oral history best practices, how to lead community projects, how to use digital archives, um, to guide them with their own research projects. 
So I think it's really bold of me to say that I developed a new writer's project, but I think I did. Thanks, Benji, for the shout out. Um, I wanted to build upon the work of the Federal Writers Project to create an indigenous community-driven archival project that focuses on the life histories of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. They're affiliated with our institution. The school was originally an Indian normal school and it has a very long history of how it became part of the UNC state system. So earlier this week on Monday, we interviewed 18 Lum Lumbee elders to document their cultural and environmental changes that they've experienced in their homelands during the past 50 years. And I'm so proud of, of my students for the way that they conducted themselves ethically and sensitively. We spent a lot of time in the first week of the program talking about our own privilege as researchers and as university uh, individuals and then going out to the community and what that brings and how we might be perceived. Uh, also recognizing how different our backgrounds are, so to respect people. Um, and that's really, I think, an important part of whenever you collect an oral history. So they access traditional knowledge from a community standpoint for public access, and I'm underscoring that because the Lumbee tribe um, will have full control of this archive. I think they're, they're conducting their own interviews as well. Uh, we're working together to like bridge the divide between the university and the community that it serves. Um, these, I see this work as a form of activism and as an act of reciprocity for the Lumbee's survivance. And I, I want to just uh, say that when we look at the, the representation of indigenous peoples in the, the state guides and the FWP life histories, um, it's often a narrative of extinction. And this project, I'm hoping, is, is really underscoring cultural resilience. So this level of, of community engagement provides students with, with an opportunity to lead critical conversations about the preservation of indigenous cultures, confronting the historical legacy of white supremacy and colonialism, while helping to support and heal communities that have been silenced for far too long. Thank you. So I'm going to try to really stick to the script here and stay to 10 minutes so Guha doesn't give me the signal. Um, so he's, he's putting up uh, my, my PowerPoint, which I do have. So once again, I'm Deborah Mutnick. I teach at Long Island University's Brooklyn campus. And in what follows, I'm paying homage to the Federal Writers Project as the founder and director of the Voices of Lefferts Community History Project in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, the People's Republic of Brooklyn. And it really so resonates with Aunt, what Anna is talking about, with, uh, what the kind of projects that are going on in DC in, in several ways, and we'll see how. Um, so the slideshow is just coming up. Let me, it's okay. I'm gonna wait for it, because I wanna go to slide two. Um, well, actually, while, while he's doing that, okay, here it comes. All right, so um, since 2017, together with a project team of editors, photographers, and a graphic designer, we've been holding free community writing workshops, publishing a journal twice a year, and collecting oral history interviews. And I'll just say one thing that I wasn't, it's not part of my script, but it's been on my mind. Um, we, I was also inspired not just by the Federal Writers Project, but by a project in, in the UK, which you may have heard of or may not have heard of. It's the Federation of Worker, Writers, and Community Publishers. They formed in the 1970s, and one of the things that they emphasized was that they didn't want a mediator. They didn't want anybody else coming in and telling their stories. They wanted to write their own stories. And I was very influenced by that, and that's why what started as, out as an oral history project um, became a writing project and bringing people into a writing workshop in order to develop their own essays and their own voices, any level of literacy, including illiteracy. We, we work with anybody. And I, these are, we've published um, 12, 10 issues of, of this journal. Um, oops. So this is Otto Niels. He's a very well-known African-American artist in Brooklyn and should be better known. Um, and so most of it's black and white photography, and you'll, we, we, we've modeled this after the FSA photographs in part, um, and 
Um, it includes now an excerpt of, we did restart an oral history program, and um, it includes excerpts of oral histories and an art feature, which is in color. It's the only color part. Um, and so we've, we've been inspired by all three of the major FWP collections, the American Guide series, the American Life histories, and the 2300 interviews with formerly enslaved people. Um, we've also been influenced by the collection of black and white farm security administration photographs documenting life in the 1930s. You've seen those pictures already today. Some of them, here you see Dorothea Lang's iconic migrant mother. I'm sure you've seen that photograph, as well as photographs by John Batchen and Gordon Parks. And then on the right is the cover of the very first issue of Voices of Lefferts, the Flatbush PLG Community Writing Journal. Um, and um, you can see that we're, we're, we're really inspired by the ethos of the FSA. Um, so PLG stands for Prospect Lefferts Gardens. It's a contested name by many longtime residents who insist the neighborhood is Flatbush. Um, here um, is a short audio clip, wait just a second, from an oral history with Irma Watkins Owens, a historian who has lived in the neighborhood since 1995 and describes the gentrification that's taking place there, and I'll let her say it in her words. Have you seen a lot of changes in the neighborhood since you've settled? You, you said you came in 1995, but maybe even knew the neighborhood before then when you were walking you know through it. The wrong clip. Uh -oh. it, can you oh, well, yes. Obviously, there have there been tremendous it, changes since it, 1995. So, um, yeah, uh, keep since going. arriving, and I, I'm not just talking about the houses, the 600 houses in, in, in the manor, but um, the whole neighborhood. I'm sure it was predominantly... African American and, and African Caribbean. And um, since that time, there's just been um, more um, young, white professionals, students, um, and homeowners who have, have moved in. Um, so it's, it's, um, well, it is a, a more gentrified than it was in 1995, but it was approaching, gradually approaching gentrification, I think, in, in the late 90s, but um, more so in their early, mid to early 2000s. So. Have you seen a lot of change? Yeah. Um, so in 2020, the first year of the pandemic, like Zawadi Morris's C19 project and many others that sprang up, Voices of Leffert started our COVID-19 project. The following year, we embarked on our first special theme of food, turning for inspiration to America Eats, the FWP's unpublished collection of essays, recipes, and photographs documenting American food ways. And that's from the, one of the FWP memos stating the goals of American Eats, subject matter of the book, American Cookery and the Part It Is Played in the National Life as exemplified in the group meals that preserve not only traditional dishes, but also attitudes and customs. Est emphasis should be divided between the food and the people. Um, and um, so this is, um, you know, I think this is the wrong version that I, you're, you're, you're playing, but it's okay. Of the, uh, uh, I'm going to read just one of these excerpts. Um, so uh, this is um, Andrea Phillips Merriman, um, who wrote Millicent and She Fish Heads. Um, Girl, I was down by Flatbush and Church Avenue, and the woman was snapping the tip of every. You know, I can't read this. Oh, it's too loud. It's too. It's, it's too. Can you read it? Uh, you can see it. Yeah. The tip of every okra she pick up. They were laughing, stepping out of their COVID cocoons into some portal of younger days and the memory of exploits and the smell of the hot earth releasing its pleasure after the lashing of the rain and the foods kept in a region of their imagination that linked them to their ancestors and taste of many hands that made food sweet. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I had tried to shorten this. Um, so somehow our videos got, and PowerPoints got confused. Um, so let's see, where am I? So this year, we got funding for our second special initiative, Whose Streets, Our Streets, Remain, Reclaim, Rebuild. 
We've just completed this year's writing workshop and have begun collecting oral histories on this theme. I'm gonna show a rough cut of a proof of concept video. It is a rough cut, please remember that. Um, in progress, Shauna Sabio, and this also resonates with um, Anna, what Anna was telling us about DC, um, participated in the writing workshop and tells the story of the Flatbush African burial ground and the struggle around that to preserve it from development. So you can play the clip. So we're gonna do a thing called radical listening. What radical listening looks like is you're just gonna look at the person. Listen, don't respond, don't mm-hmm, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. No, none of that. You're gonna talk for a minute, listen intently, and then when the person is done, you'll thank them, and then it'll be your turn to talk and share. What is your connection to Brooklyn? Shana is the founder and director of Grow House. She's, she's been doing that for, for a long time and um, it's uh, an organization that works to um, mitigate displacement and to help people who live in the neighborhood stay in the neighborhood. One, two, two. are you in it? One. The walking tours that I've been doing at the burial ground I think um, at their heart are a part of like reclaiming stories that are in danger of being lost. Inside the closet, they noticed a set of stairs. They walked up the stairs. And so the way the walking tour is structured is I'm really trying to recreate the lives of the people who were enslaved here um, and even free here and not look at enslavement as just a toiling, horrible situation, but stories of resilience and resistance. And so they're different characters that are illuminated throughout the tours. Could we get more out of this? This is what they I can fit it. So when you see, if you have Sankofa 1, I'm going to ask you to read. What does that mean to you when you hear Sankofa? What does that mean? Yeah, I think that your past is your guide to your future. If you don't know your past, you won't know where you're going. Ideally, it may be painful what you may have gone through, but you need that in order to grow and learn from those mistakes and not to repeat it. Thank you. Every 50 years, there's been an uprising of some sort because we haven't taken the time as a nation to reckon with the legacies of enslavement. And that's part of what we're here to do today is to talk about this Flatbush African burial ground, which is behind us right here. Um, and talk about what it might have been like for enslaved people, what lessons can we garner from their stories, and then how do we make better decisions about the future based on what we know. So first of all, just welcome um, to uh, the Voices of Wefford's Community History Project. This project is inspired by the work that I've done, the research that I've done on the Federal okay. Writers Project in the 1930s. The Federal Writers Project was a project that was, its mission was really defined by inclusivity, diversity, um, and making, making a place for everybody. Brooklyn has a name, an ever-evolving, tragic, gestured name that is still evolving. It's native, like Carnarcy and Rockaway, like Iroquois and Shinnecock, that name that inhabited. So I look back. Like I look back at the look. I back. believe very firmly that anybody can write, and then it's a matter of practice. It's not a um, matter of genius. Everybody can tell their story, and if you don't tell your story, somebody else is going to tell it for you. you know, these are just fragments of thoughts that I had been journaling about, and decided to put them together in one piece. So I guess I'll start. On school days when I was growing up. I was not allowed outside the front gate of my home at 539 Park Street in Brooklyn. The sharp clang of the gate slamming when I arrived home, its vibration and final silence sealed me off from the other kids on the block who were free to roam as they wished. They seemed to have a confidence in their ability to navigate their world, a freedom that I envied. We make history. Um, we live in history. We can't, we can't actually escape from it. And so the history, the personal history that she's telling um, has to be part of a longer history. Every people needs their origin stories and the oral historians who will help make meaning of them. Those seeds have grown roots. Through my work at the Flatbush African Burial Ground, I've uncovered 
stories of enslavement, fugitivity, resistance. Now I see history as a form of future visioning, preserving stories as a way to resist displacement and the erasure that accompanies it. The history is all of ours, um, and it doesn't matter what our own particular circumstances are of our birth, um, which is entirely accidental. Nobody chooses to be born a certain way. We are all born, um, and we come into this world, and we all inherit the same history. I just want to say thank you to everybody. This has been a really wonderful workshop, yes. um, and you will be hearing from us because we have more work to do, even yes. though we don't meet again until the author So um, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to let them have the last word. Um, you saw a, a, a contemporary project in, in process. Um, we have lots of work to do still. Shauna's essay will be published in uh, issue number 12, I believe, of the journal. And I, the, I, the last thing I want to say, I'm not going to read these quotes, but I want to put all of what we've been doing today, and this is already, this is another theme that reverberates into the context of an approach to history known as history from below, or a people's history, um, to link that project mostly seen as rooted in the 1960s and starting with E.P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class to the 1930s New Deal programs, um, especially the FWP and the FSA. And thank you very much for all of what you have done, Guha, and for everybody who's organized this, and for all of you for coming today. that were not the original questions I was going to ask, but they're questions that came up when you were talking. It was not like throw you for a loop. Um, and so one of them is about education. Um, and this is really for all of you, if you want to speak to it. Um, but, you know, it's Benji, you said, you know, education, thinking of education as a journey. Um, and um, the FWP, uh, you know, quoting Ellison, is an improvised graduate school. And I wonder, like, what did they learn? What did the F what did the federal writers learn by working in the federal writers project? Because we can say it was an improvised graduate, but what did that really mean? And then, what are we all learning? What are you all learning from doing this and from studying the federal writers? You talked about that a little bit, but can we can we dig a little bit deeper into that? Yeah, I'll I'll start by saying um, I've learned a lot about how to teach beyond the binary of black and white, which is not easy to do. I'm in the South and uh, I think the point that I made during my talk about the history of erasure and how to confront that in the classroom is not easy to do, but I'm in a community where there are indigenous people and uh, to see indigenous students in the classroom addressing this and reclaiming their own um, their own ancestry and questioning the representation of their people is a very powerful thing to witness. So I learn every day from my students. And the other thing I'd like to make, uh, the other point is I teach working class literature and often my students tell me, Dr. Fazio, this is so depressing. <laughs> and I'm like, it's real life, man. It's good. Like we need to, we need to talk about this. But what I'm discovering in the life histories is, is how much humor comes out in the stories of the working class uh, and of immigrants telling these beautiful stories of the old country. And I think we could look at labor uh, not just as a negative, oh, look at the pain and suffering of these individuals, but how are they celebrating everyday life and families and culture and sharing you know, remedies that are ridiculous and funny, but they work. Right, so just to have students even bring in their own family histories and discussion of their cultures with the life histories, I think is really important and telling. One of the things that uh, resonates with a lot of the students in my classes and uh, people working on some of the public history, public humanities projects I work with is how much everyday people understand some of the systems that they are part of and the, the 
historical contexts uh, that bring them to this point and um, where they're situated within society that it's easy for us to say, oh, the Federal Writers Project is just about these stories of people's experiences, but also layered into that, that I think a lot of my students don't anticipate are these conversations about what are these larger systems, systems of racism, of labor exploitation, of sexism, um, that are part of these stories that they, they talk about and talk about in, in pretty profound ways. And that is helpful for pushing students to think about how everyday people understand their lives in very complex ways. Um, in very complex societies, and that it's not just academics who think about this, um, but everyday people think about this and understand their lives and have something to say and to contribute to the conversation. Yeah, I think one of the things that we learn and that they learned in some cases um, uh, is that we, we learn from the people that we interview as much as they learn or get from us, and that they have a lot to teach us. Um, and particularly those of us in the academy. I have like a whole book's worth to say about what Rafael Lisson learned on the project, um, and so I'm, I'm nervous to get started for five cents and then I'm gonna need to charge 10,000 to shut up, um, but I'll, I'll try. Um, one thing that's on my mind uh, is Ellison's, if you look at Ellison's body of work, especially his essays, he's very interested in the concept of initiation. Um, and there's something about oral history work, meaningful conversations, to think of that as a way of getting initiated into cultural history, cultural memory, ways of looking at reality, the world. Um, so I think about that just in kind of general terms. Because again, Ellison himself says like, you know, doing this work on the New York City Project taught, taught me my people's history, right? Like one is not born knowing one's culture, one is initiated all the time, right? Early childhood is just a series of initiation experiences um, into how one's family culture um, kind of functions. Uh, so I think that's really inspiring for me as an oral historian. Like I've learned how to see the world through all the different lenses that my narrators offer me. Um, and then to try to put that together into a composite of, well, what was, for instance, the general way of looking at the world that a really smart kid growing up in uh, the relatively elite segment of Black Little Rock, like Herbert Denton, what generally would have been the way he would have looked on the world, and then how would that have affected his work as a writer? Um, so that's like one one answer I can give, and then there, there's more, but I'll, I'll hold off there for now. Yeah, no, yeah. I think yeah. Um, adding initiation to one of those, those terms that we think about the Federal Writers Project and the contemporary projects that it can inspire is really helpful, so thank you for that. Are there any questions from the audience? She's coming with the mic. So, so um, as I've mentioned in the work that I've done regarding uh, working with students in education and these interviews, really relates to empathy um, because oftentimes when kids are talking about slavery, there's this sense of antagonism between the binary, the white and the black. And everybody in, in between is missing. And so by focusing on the life, the, the life stories of people, we can focus on creating empathy. And I wondered where empathy worked in your own work for education. That's a great question. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's it's like the most foundational virtue that we have to practice as oral historians for sure. Um, one person I forgot to mention at, at the beginning of my, my remarks was um, my fellow co-chair for this year's Oral History Association conference, uh, which will take place in October in Baltimore on the theme of oral history and education. Um, his name is Zahir Ali, and Zahir gives an amazing workshop. If you can get him to come to your institution, try to get him. Uh, he gives a great workshop on listening as a creative act, um, and it's specifically geared towards high school students um, to really appreciate the creativity that is inherent to being a good listener. Um, I can't reprise what Zahir would do if he, if he were here, um, so I won't try, but that's, that's the basic message um, that yeah, like was evoked in, in the video, like listening is a really oh, radical um, and foundational humanistic kind of act. And, and that it can be very painful. And, and that part of, part of developing empathy um, is to be able to 
hold that and and uh, process it and and to express it and to find ways of of talking about the pain of history and how painful it is not only for the um, th those who were have been oppressed historically but also for those who are the descendants of oppressors who are very find it very difficult to face that past and it's part of I think what is so divisive in the country right now and what's creating so much antagonism in uh, you know probably more than half the states now towards teaching black history towards teaching queer history um, you know that this is very threatening and and so you know that empathy becomes so critical in terms of overcoming this 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 fear I think a lot of it comes from fear and, it, and it, it's something hard to cultivate but we must can I say one one more thing because this this was something I wanted to bring up to your question about what did someone like Ellison learn and it's kind of a I'm gonna try to answer your question in a way that might be unexpected um, one thing Ellison talks about in later interviews about what the project taught him his experience of working on the project uh, is that he like by day he would go and you know collect children's rhymes or you know interview people on the sidewalk on 8th Avenue and 125th Street um, and then by night he would go home and do his reading which was the great American classics, right? And so he has a line in an interview where he says that the rhythms and the idioms coming from my interviewees was straight out of Twain and Henry James. Um, and so it, your question about empathy gets me to, it, it might be a weird segue, but I think as an oral historian, like I, I have learned how beautiful everybody's speech is like ev like the the delight that one can take in how somebody expresses themselves and we might call this vernacular or idiomatic um, but there's something about like the like the beauty of speech itself um, that I wonder if that's a way to maybe get people to kind of empathize with the person they're hearing is like just enjoy what it sounds like to listen to them you know um, I don't know if that's too off the wall, um, but I don't know if I'm making sense. And if I can say there's also the empathy of um, understanding people within your own community, within your own neighborhood, within your own project. Um, I did a student project with the humanities truck um, of getting undergrads to research the history of labor on campus and then create an exhibit in public engagement using the truck. And it was very interesting because they all started out as sort of collectively, um, you know, on the side of laborers and pro-unionism and or unionizing um, and uh, very progressive. And then as they started to do the research and they started to engage their, their peers in some of these conversations, they still held those same positions, but they also, gave more space to trying to understand the administration's position and what some of these larger conversations were about. I, I think Guha is telling us we have to end. Is that what you're telling me? Um, let me let me just, just end then. Um, oh yeah, please, Greg, sorry. It's, it's about the, the question of black and white binaries in the South and empathy and all this. Olivia Settle's, Settle Egypt's work w remained unpublished at Fisk until the mid 1940s when a new Japanese born, oh, Iowa trained sociologist, Jitsuichi Matsuoka, collected them into a volume called The Unwritten History of Slavery which was then published, and it was the basis of his 40-year career teaching at Fisk. And he was asked why he was assigned this project, and he didn't know, but the, the most plausible answer is that he wasn't white and he wasn't black. And if I can add on to that, it's, um, that's a very interesting example, because in the introduction to that volume, Ophelia Settle Egypt's name is listed first, even though she in oral histories doesn't remember being part of creating that volume. Um, and she also tried to publish her own collection of edited oral histories that she did and could never find a publisher to publish it. And so if someone would like to, that's not a project I can take on right now, but her manuscripts are sitting in the archives unpublished.
And I, and I also just wanted to give a shout out to um, Betsy Bowen, who participated in the Summer Institute that we ran in 2021, um, who does a project with her students on literacy in the um, narratives of formerly enslaved people. Um, it's in the program, you'll see it, it's highlighted, and it's called Reading Slavery, Writing Freedom. Um, and she's had her students read many, many of the narratives and look for aspects of literacy. Where, where are they talking about whether they could read or write, um, how they learn to read or write, and there's lots of that. And I think that also is a way of um, you know, developing a, a better understanding of the, of the capacities of people who were oppressed and are oppressed. And I think that also is a way of um, fostering empathy. Um, and, and just uh, the last note, because we're, the food is awaiting us, and it's been a long day, and we're so grateful to everybody um, who made this possible, um, is that the program, which we don't have physical copies of, is online, and you'll see the bio, bios of all of the presenters and their work and lots of other work um, and archival uh, resources um, on the FWP here at the Library of Congress. So don't forget that. Please take a look at it. And thank you all for coming today.